Hi, I'm Paul Ryan, and welcome to America's Heartland. Today, we're at the University of California at Davis at their School of Veterinary Medicine. The overriding goal here is to provide the best animal care through teaching, research, and public service. And the best of care is exactly what Prissy the cow is getting today by way of a thorough examination by a couple of the school's veterinary students. Now, why is all this important to the heartland? Well, large animal veterinarians are critical to the nation's food supply and overall animal health. We tagged along with one large animal vet in Massachusetts to see what their life is like in the field. Dr. Frederick Hess has the kind of morning commute most people would envy. His office sits just a few hundred feet from his 19th century home and newly built barn in the picturesque Pioneer Valley of western Massachusetts. This is ground zero for Dr. Hess, a large animal veterinarian of more than 40 years, and his two assistants, Nan and Josh. I called Fostick to see if there's anything changed with the cow. I didn't get any answer. Hess is one of a declining number of food supply veterinarians in the country. More on that later. Their first stop is a local dairy farm just up the road. Hess makes regular visits to some 60 farms in the area. Most visits are routine checkups, but today he's at this milking parlor to set up a device called a lactoquarter, measuring the volume of milk over time. All right, Chris, we got the... Uh, I think you've worked this with me before, haven't you? The monitoring system tells Dr. Hess whether cows are being prepped properly, whether milking equipment is in good working order, and whether cows are milking out to their maximum potential. She's milking, Ricky. What did she give on test, do you know? Hess likes to use the latest technology available in his bovine practice. You'll often find him walking around in a herd of cows with a lightweight portable machine strapped to his hip. This is an ultrasound unit that, that uh, I can wear on my waist and I can visualize the images in, the, in eyeglasses. The device is used for pregnancy exams. He simply inserts a probe to get a good look at the uterus. Oh yeah, we got it right here, yep, pregnant. Dr. Hess prefers ultrasound over the more traditional palpation, saying it's more accurate in early pregnancy diagnosis. Our whole reproductive program is about get these cows bred early. So if I can tell accurately that she's open, in other words, she's not yes, pregnant, she's at 30 days rather than waiting to 42 days, I think we're gaining a lot. Four decades of experience prepares Hess for anything that comes his way. On the day we visited with him, the longtime vet dealt with a lame cow that had an infected hoof, a new foal that needed a physical exam, and a slightly emaciated cow that had a displaced abomasum, meaning one of its stomachs was in an abnormal position. Now I'm going to suture to the peritoneum. Dr. Hess and his assistant Nan Tebow work side by side, lending a hand to each other as they tackle each malady. It's truly a team effort and Hess appreciates the help. Having uh, people like that that are real conscientious, and organized and listen well and uh, implement what you tell them, that's really important. And Tebow has an undergrad degree in animal science. She's worked with Hess on and off for a number of years. This hands-on training will help prepare Tebow for a possible future in food supply veterinary medicine. Working for him, you get as a lots of experience and you're better able to apply those skills, I think, to certain situations. One unexpected situation Hess and his team need to figure out why this cow is behind schedule for calfing. A rectal palpation provides some answers, but the doctor isn't happy with what he's discovered. While pregnancy exams are routine part of Dr. Hess's practice, every now and then a complication arises when a cow's about to calf. The one you see behind me has a twisted uterus, and that means Dr. Hess will have to perform a C-section to deliver the calf and correct the problem. Surgery in a barn is the reality for emergency situations like this, not to mention a sometimes unruly patient. We may have to sit here. When Hess makes his incision, an unusual amount of blood starts to pour out, a sign the calf's in trouble. All this fluid from her peritoneal cavity is not normal. Assistant Josh Boyden does his part to control the animal from behind. Boyden plans a future as a veterinarian. He admits that working real-life cases is a lot different from his textbook scenarios. If you make one mistake, you're always going to remember it. Um, if you miss a question on an exam, you know, you're probably, you know, as long as it's over 60, you know, you're just going to roll with it. Um, so it's definitely valuable in that respect. Unfortunately, this delivery has no storybook ending. 
Once inside, Dr. Hess realizes the calf is stillborn and needs to be removed. The cow's uterus is also ruptured and will need stitches to repair it. It's kind of a tough one when you think, you know, it's a perfectly normal calf and we missed it by 24 hours, but I, you can't, there was no way, no way you were ever going to tell that. In the course of a day, Hess and his assistants will log close to 150 miles on the road. His coverage area extends into Vermont and as far south as Rhode Island. He has such a wide territory because he's one of the few remaining large animal vets in the area. I don't really know hard numbers. For sure, there's a shortage of food animal veterinarians, a shortage of every technical person I know. At the turn of the 20th century, practically every vet was a food supply veterinarian. Today, estimates show less than 18 percent work full time in that capacity. And that percentage is expected to decline further unless something is done. Maybe people feel like they can make more money staying in you know, a small animal hospital, but I think it really just depends where your interests are. That reality is a factor for many students choosing a major in vet school. But Boyden also believes it has to do with a lack of exposure. We aren't really um, exposed to, you know, to the kind of things that you could, you know, that you could do in the field. And I think maybe if more people were, they'd, you know, get fired up and, and, and be more interested in it. Some states and ag schools have begun programs to encourage more students in this area. Critical steps as Americans demand healthy and wholesome food. Regardless of the reasons, Dr. Hess worries about what farmers will have to do if large animal vets become even more scarce. I find that when I go to areas where there's no, has no been, hasn't been a, a convenient veterinarian for years, farmers learn how to take care of things themselves. Not the best. For now, this veteran of veterinary medicine has no immediate plans to retire. This is too much fun. I don't know what I'd do. I mean, I haven't got any interest in doing anything. Instead, he plans to focus on staying ahead of the curve by using his training and technology on preventative health programs, a collaborative effort that benefits both the animal and the farmer. And what's better than a, for the soul than to make, uh, to make a change and see a response? I mean, that to me is the whole crux of agriculture.